Palingenesis by Simon Herewood. Book 2 Darkening Tide Chapter 4 A Touch of Art Garth looked down at his shaking hands. Had he ever been as deluded and self-willed as this cursed and twisted son of Veer? What a strange fate that had him confront his own stubborn pride in such a way. Why did he have need of such a perversely obstinate man as Rune Seth Elberad? He would as happily strangle him to death as look at him again. He became aware of the eyes of the other men on him. Hanik was the first to break the uncomfortable silence. An unwilling blade will never strike true. There was nothing but sad resignation in his voice. Garth looked at him without reply, the boiling anger still apparent in his eyes. A heavy, painful sigh escaped him. <sighs> Let me speak with him, Hanik offered. I know he has little resistance, and one insults his courage and ability with the blade. Perchance I may persuade him to perform one more task. The old man shrugged, pretending mastery of his ill humor. Perchance it is time to let go of this plan, to do the best with what is available to me, instead of chasing after the unattainable. Now that we have to face monsters heretofore unknown, there is much to prepare and little time for preparation. He rose from the table. Speak to him if you wish, Anik. I will make use of him if he is still to be persuaded. That evening, Karth sent for Gareth. The boy had a strange talent for dispelling a dark mood, even though it meant he would pester and plead for more information than he could possibly digest. His willingness to learn and his insatiable thirst for knowledge were traits that secretly pleased the old man. At least one person he knew was not eager to pass judgment without first gathering as many facts as were available to him. This night proved to be no exception. Gareth had hardly taken his place before the fire, for the first questions were out. What was the council? Who were the ten? Garth settled his chin in a cupped hand. The council was a trap. An elaborate, intricate, clever design for the proud and strong to fall into. And the ten... All but three of them were the fools to be ensnared. Only four remain of that number, Malik and his queen, old Karth of Heron Inrath, and the keeper of the towers. I will tell you the tale of the haughty council and the fall of Kale, at least my side of it. Of the six that are here no longer, five perished during the summoning, and one, Turin, was slain by Veer when the council was still in its infancy. The boy's eyes widened. Yes, I know. And Veer asked him not to return here. He has uh, shown you this? It happened long before the summoning, before the Viron had a proper sense of themselves as a nation. And did he return? Is that what happens when you are immortal? You return to Myro? How is it done? Are you born as a baby? One question at a time. Garth held up both hands as if to ward off the mirage. No. He did not as far as I know. Neither did the other five, uh, at least not to the inland sea region. Yes, you are born after a time as a baby who remembers nothing and who has to discover his identity, his purpose for being here, the sins that have to be atoned for. And this has happened to you? No, not yet. And I certainly hope it doesn't. Malik attempted to get rid of me the other day and you prevented him. But if he had succeeded, my role would have been a different place when I returned to it, ignorant and vulnerable. Why would you return? It is my curse, my sentence. Do not think of perpetual life as a blessing. Not when you are bound to a place like this, separated from your purpose, from what you were expressed for. My role is a prison to me, where I am confronted day in and day out with the consequences of what I have done. Not in this world only. This is but the result of greater misdeeds, that much I have discovered, and here my character is weighed to see if there is something worth redeeming, a sort of a second chance, a way to prove that my first transgression was a mistake, 
Not something I would repeat. Gareth was staring at him in an odd way. Where did you come from? What was your purpose there? Garth did not reply. He looked into the flames for a long time, though the words no longer hung in the air, demanding a response. Then he continued as if there had been no interruption, and no dreamlike foray outside the bounds of their world. We had too much power. We knew too much. Time was on our side. The cycles passed for us as mere days. Our bodies remained in the prime of life. It is strange that in all our cleverness, we never really considered why this was so. Why the rest of Myrol aged and we did not. At least, I did not consider it. It is apparent, as you will realize later on, that Malik had, and so had Elena. But our unending youth set us apart. It was a power, an unequaled opportunity to gather knowledge and skill and better ourselves with it. Not the wisest and longest living among the peoples of Myrol could begin to rival or even compare with such as we were. And we basked in our superiority. In a benevolent way, we enjoyed our special position. After all, how our lesser neighbors could benefit from our vast experience, all our accumulated expertise. We would guide at first, advise, and direct the lesser mortals, even of our own tribes, even of the Viron. We would not share our knowledge, oh no. In the wrong hands it would be devastating, and the wrong hands were any outside our own. But it was a tiresome thing in the end, for each generation had to be taught the same lessons, each proud and foolish ruler humbled and instructed. No one could tell just when guidance became control, advice became command, and direction decree. It seemed so right to combine our energies in a benevolent council for the good of all, so proper. We convinced ourselves even of its necessity. Myrol entered a time of peace and prosperity. The lesser arts flourished. There was trade between former enemies. Even our troubled southern border was quiet for cycles on end. It was too quiet, of course. An artificial sort of quiet. Orchestrated. Calamity was biding its time. We ruled and played as creators, and we were blind to the mesmerizing snake in our midst. While we directed Myrol, Malik directed us. He chose the eastern marshlands as his area of influence, his own little kingdom. From there, he raided the barbarians to the south, systematically subjecting the tribes of Amul, till he had knitted them together in the Gudrid Empire. For two hundred long, lazy cycles, he led us like asses from the marketplace. We shaped the portal veil to travel vast distances in a matter of hours. To meet whenever we felt the need and spy on the kings of the lesser peoples, I, the supreme fool, was made chief overseer of the realm, a position I believed I was suited for. My folly did not end there, no. It only deepened once I had been inaugurated. We were quick to send aid when Malik reported a new outbreak of the Scourge. According to him, his realm had been all but overrun. A horde of unprecedented size had once more swarmed up from the desert lands and was already knocking at the gates of Ligerium. They had slaughtered the inhabitants of the border villages and subjected many to the vilest of tortures. There were reports of large-scale destruction, and their numbers were compared to the leaves in the old forest. Fear rippled through Ligerium, and even parts of Viron like a rock tremor. An urgent and energetic response was called for. This was well beyond our old and ailing Viron king, who had grown accustomed to the idea of a peaceful old age. He was already fading rapidly, and ready to depart Myrol. Here I committed what turned out to be my greatest act of folly. On Malik's urging, I plotted against the life of Juris, banished his uninspiring sons, and assumed the throne of Viron myself. My welcome was not a warm one. Several noble families among the Viron refused to join when I issued the decree of assembly. Risking a civil war, I forced them to submit through means I would rather not mention. Malik secretly ingratiated himself with these disgruntled nobles and won over some fellow conspirators. Meanwhile, I fortified Aruis and sent what help I could spare to the beleaguered Ligerians. 
The Council met, and it was decided to move a force from Aaron through the Portal Vale to meet our garrison in Erois. This force never arrived, and without their help, Erois fell within days. The ward swept into Viron unimpeded. Pygerium had been laid waste, and Ingerwal plundered. The mood among the nobles and commoners alike was growing more frantic by the day. I concluded an alliance with Bengar the Red, and Estig of the Vatran. We enlisted every able-bodied man in Viron, or so we thought. We fought the Horde to a standstill outside Gerdel, but we took terrible losses. It was then that the truth about the missing Aaronite force came out. They had been ambushed and slaughtered to a man, the High King's only son among them, when emerging from the Portal Veil. Vale. At that moment, I had the first inkling that we had a traitor in our midst. I assembled the council, and together we wove a magic against the remaining horde. The chieftains were eliminated, and the confused cohorts fell to quarreling and eventually broke apart. It was a simple matter, though it took the greater part of a cycle, to hunt down and exterminate the roving bands. I had to leave parties of hunters in the south, for the High King Gervain in Aaron had declared a war of blood on the battle weary Viron. His intent was vengeance for the death of his heir. This was the kind of war that could be endless, and the Viron nobles had no stomach for it. They needed a quick sacrifice to appease the wrath of the High King, a person to blame for the recent misfortunes. That person was I. Malik saw to it. He sang the whole saga of old Jura's death and supposed heroism to the four winds and organized an uprising of nobles against me. It became more and more difficult for me to find friends or even just allies. Malik's invisible web of treachery now hedged me in on every side. His surprisingly intact army was helping with rebuilding in Ligerium, and the Sea Ravens were bought over quite easily. Only the Vadrin remained aloof, but it was through their aid alone that I managed my escape in the end. He was never my equal in the art, but my trust had made me vulnerable. Since that time, I've mended my ways in that regard, he smiled wryly. I remained on the throne for six dreary cycles, resorting to fear to ensure loyalty. I delved ever deeper in the arcane to fuel a hopeless struggle alienating even the war priests. At last, I found myself trapped in old Belruth, with a mere three score of my most trusted followers. Desperation drove me to one last act of foolish pride, a summoning. Yes, I had sunk to the lows of sorcery. I protected myself as best I could, and set upon friend and foe alike a legion of Eiriks. I overtaxed my strength and remained comatose for days. When I wakened, it was to a horror-struck land. In their short lives, the creatures had maimed and murdered scores of soldiers and innocents alike. They had desecrated and destroyed the city and the temple. The very walls of Belruth were crumbling. Bodies were strewn everywhere, horrible death etched on their faces. I woke up in more ways than one. A madness passed from me. Of course, I played right into Malik's hands. There was no way I could face my own people again after such a deed. All the misfortunes of the past cycles were blamed on me. My name became a byword. Curse rolled off the sneering tongue with hate. I had lost everything. My pride, my ambition. The words trailed off at last, leaving a heavy silence between them. Their eyes were fixed on the dancing flames, where the creatures of Kale's summoning still wreaked havoc in the old city. His tired voice described the horrible scene. I was too weak to control them. The forces ranged against me were too powerful to withstand for long. This made me desperate and I miscalculated. It would have been terrible even if I had had the mastery of them. The old man gasped at the memory. They went as far as Stor and Ingerval on the coast. Two thousand battle-crazed destroyers. He placed his face in his hands. The veins stood out thickly under the mottled skin. More than half the children of Veer perished. Before the summoning cord was broken, he looked sideways at the silent child. I cannot show myself in Nuria, not even on a field of battle, ever again. Gareth knelt at his feet, reached up and took Garth's hand in both of his. 
Their eyes met. You are not Kale the Summoner. You are not an evil man. I was a proud man and did evil things. Gareth felt the sadness, the regret, wash over him. Had he not also done things he would undo if only he could? He had struck down a man in Aaron. He had meant to destroy him, and he had caused the suffering and death of his brother. The steady rhythm of Karth's heartbeat, pulsed in the lined hand, he still held. He bent down to touch it with his cheek. A whisper came to him, spoken somewhere during his time in Aaron, and escaped his mouth. Would you make things right? The old man pulled away slowly, then turned and gripped the boy by the shoulders. That is the reason I remain in my role. My personal battle with Malik is but a result of this. For a while they stared at each other. The question and answer hung between them like something tangible. Karth felt a strange stirring inside him. For the first time he was utterly convinced of the truth of what he had said, and the boy with Veer's features had sensed it also. His youthful voice seemed to come from a great distance. I believe you. The fire was dying down. It had to be well past the second watch. Garth got up to stir the embers. The rhyme song chill had become noticeable. Behind him, the boy stretched out his legs on the rug. How do you make it right again? The old man shrugged mechanically. Had he not considered this very question for cycles without count? I do not know. If I have come to my role to atone for my crimes, I have only managed to multiply my transgression till now. In the heat of battle, I still looked only to my own security, my own prestige. But I regret it, and though I still strive, it is not for the sake of greatness or the adoration of men any longer. I have no name but a borrowed one, no kingdom but this lonely, forsaken place. Instead of returning to his chair, Karth settled on a low stool in front of the fire. Why is it that I tell you secrets I dare not breathe to another soul? Karth sighed deeply, and placed his chin in his hand as if his thoughts had made his head too heavy to support. It matters little now, I suppose. All my enemies know them. My friends are few, and the time has come to end all secrets. In spite of the heavy words spoken between them the day before, Rune accepted Karth's invitation to lunch with him. Far from being resentful at the other's open scorn, he felt that he had won a minor victory during the stormy encounter. At least the old man had spoken his mind, instead of playing another of his games. It was a relief to be reminded of what he actually thought. Both parties kept clear of what had been said, though neither apologized. A mutual politeness governed their dealings, and surprisingly little animosity surfaced. Karth kept his voice neutral, as if he was conducting a business transaction. I asked you before whether you think the rabble we have brought here from the southern jungles could be made into something resembling a fighting force. That would depend on how much time we have to train them, and the kind of warfare for which you would use them. Was there a hidden sting in the last comment? Karth ignored it. They will man this fortress and face great numbers of tribesmen landing here by boat. The aim of this resistance will be to delay the invasion of Aaron and inflict as much damage on the Gudrid forces as possible. I do not mean to sacrifice them. There is a way of escape once the situation becomes hopeless. At a prearranged signal, our ships will sweep in and pick them off the island. The Sea Raven fleet will burn the Gudrid boats and destroy those who manage to put to sea. Thus, there will be no pursuit. The survivors, which would comprise the vast majority of the initial force, will be landed in Erin to aid them in turning back the invasion. Rune appeared mystified. Why do you tell me all this? Karth raised his eyebrows. Did you not ask to learn their use? I know that you have scruples when it comes to sacrificing men for gain, however noble the cause. Rune watched him closely. Was there a shadow of a smile round his lips? He shrugged and poured himself more wine. If you want them to launch missiles and throw rocks at an unsophisticated enemy attempting to scale your walls, I could have them ready in a ten day. But it seems to me you would want some training for formation fighting and advanced tactics when you deploy them in Aaron. They will need to know how the Aaronites fight and how they are to support this style. I need uh, six, seven, ten days. 
You have 35 days. After that, we can leave it to Anik and the rest to complete the training. I have sergeants enough for instruction in archery, war machines, and spear work. You can pick two or three to aid you with the swordplay. Rune waited for more, but Karth had already turned away to examine the specimens in the fruit bowl. It seemed that there would be no complications this time round, or otherwise the old man was keeping them to himself. You are not going to march this lot into Terralen any time soon, then. Karth burst out laughing. <laughs> Is that what you think? And what would I do with them there? Feed them to your dragon? Rune looked at him quizzically, but when the laughter seemed real enough, he joined in reluctantly. The situation might be humorous to Karth, but there would be little the refugee force would be able to accomplish if they ever had to face the well-trained marshland bands. Also, why had the dragon suddenly become his? Karth picked up something of his mood, and the smile faded. How would one bring down a beast like that? You've had some time to consider it. Rune looked across the table at the old man. At least there had never been any question from this quarter about the validity of his testimony concerning the creature. Had Karth expected something like this after all? When it flies, it may be vulnerable to arrows at close range. If it settles anywhere, a very brave or foolish man may get close enough to touch it with a spear. The throat and the eyes are the only places I would target. To sever the head is beyond any blade that I have seen. Just where one would reach a vital organ in all that mass of a body and is hard to guess. I have imagined bringing one down with scores of fire arrows through its wings in order to immobilize it first. Then it must be disorientated by aiming for its eyes and mouth. Men with pikes could distract it long enough for a champion to go for the throat. He pursed his lips and studied the other for a reaction. Garth was frowning back at him. Provided one had a champion for this task, of course. Rune held his gaze. Of course. It was overcast the following morning, but without the immediate threat of rain. The breeze was light and variable, and would die down entirely before the noon watch commenced. More than eighteen hundred men and boys sat in motionless silence in the largest of the training yards. Brune let his eyes wander from one side to the other, as if he could assess their quality by merely looking at them. Boys from as young as thirteen cycles sat in front awed to be part of this assembly, faces stark with concentration. There were grey beards too, with weather-beaten visage lined and lowered brow, worry written there for all to see. Perhaps two hundred of the whole were from northern ancestry, containing some good specimens from the West March of Aaron in the prime of life, an encouraging sight. Even the older craftsmen, the blacksmith, the carpenters, sailmakers, and their young apprentices were present. Any person who could possibly wield a bow or sword, and several who would do little more than run errands or bring up more ammunition, just about all the males over a certain age of the Witch Isle's motley original population had been summoned here. The vast majority were Southlanders. Here, Rune could see firsthand the fruits of Hanik's labor in the jungles of the Gudrid Empire. Heron Inrath would not have been able to mount a proper defense without it. The barbarians, for the most part, did not have the appearance of warriors. In a sense, Rune preferred that, for he had little use for the primitive Southland techniques when it came to warfare. If the men were too set in their ways, valuable time would first have to be spent on breaking the mold of their thinking. Standing slightly apart from the rest, the eleven Viron serving Karth as instructors and soldiers had grouped themselves around Hanik. Rune recognized Jumil among them, whose skill with the metal sword had given him such a challenge when they had first met. Bior stood just behind him, leaning on a tall bow. None of the men wore a Viron blade. All the eyes were fixed on a solitary figure in their midst, 
an old man not yet stooped with age, the master of Heron Inrath. Karth's voice rose up among them, strong and confident, and confronted with its calculated tones, one could hardly suspect that this obvious leader of men would deliberately keep from these unfortunates the fate that awaited them. Rune struggled not to be drawn in by it, compelled by it to agree and serve and sacrifice. As it rose and fell, he could see the effect on the gathered group. It made him uncomfortable. He did not belong here with these people. His destiny was meant to unfold in a far-off place. A sudden suspicion made him look round. Behind him on a balcony, staring fixedly at his back, was the boy he had seen in the courtyard three nights before. You have escaped death in the southern lands, or slavery and suffering under the Gudrid Empire. You have been pulled from the sea, or brought out from the pits of merciless masters, outcasts, unwanted, exiled, rejected, condemned. Your lives had no more value to others, but you have been spared, somehow to be here today, on this island, to be counted as men of heart, and of quality, and of unyielding purpose. No longer of a certain tribe, owing loyalty to protectors who have failed you. Here you will stand for what is right, and true, and worthy. You will not stand for a king who played you false, or a lord who counted you but as cattle. Not for a thought, or some far-off principle. You will stand for yourselves, for your lives, and your children, for your worth, and your right to be free of fear and oppression. You will stand for your comrades, and your friends, and the love that binds you to them. You will stand against evil, and the ones who would rob you of these things. And you will not stand here but to die a hero's death, and be forgotten on this distant shore, but again, and again, on foreign fields, under thundering skies and driving tempest, wherever the dark shackles of oppression rears up, till it is finally driven from this world. This day marks the moment of your pledge. I bid you rise. As soon as the Rethu interpreter completed his translation, all the recumbent forms rose in a rustle of clothing to solemn-faced silence. Garth swept an outstretched arm from one side of the gathering to the other. Regard the man next to you, behind you. This is not the commitment to a lord, or this island. It is a commitment to one another, a promise to recapture the lives, the dignity, the worth that were stolen from us. We pledge ourselves to tomorrow. I pledge myself to you and your children, as each of you will do for the other. Alone, there waits for you but a shameful grave. Together, there is an opportunity to shape our future, free from the oppressions and ambitions of others. We cannot win the battle for Heron in wrath, but it must be fought. It must be fought to buy time for our allies, to weaken our foes and force them into error. Yet we will not sacrifice our lives here. We will escape to stand alongside those who still do not trust us today. We will earn that trust by taking up arms against those who would destroy them also. Take your pledge with me this day, for your life and the lives of your neighbors. The Viran men moved forward, dividing the gathering into groups of sixty to seventy. All the recruits were instructed to place a hand on the shoulder of the man in front, and another on that of the man to his left. Karth moved from one unit to the next, repeating the simple pledge with each one, the men repeating after him. Rune saw the effect it had on them. At first he scorned them for fools, despising their predictable response to the emotional plea. How long would it last, this teary dedication, in the face of battle? disgusted, he turned to look away. He had not been invited to join in the pledge. Perhaps Karth knew that he would not fall for such cheap trickery. 
Still, for no reason he could discover, he was irked by it. His status as outsider was reconfirmed. He was curiously insulted by the deliberate exclusion from this community, even in the face of his desire to be separate. There had not been an opportunity to refuse an invitation. It could not be that somewhere inside him there was still the forlorn hope of belonging, of trusting others with his well-being, his future. He shrugged and waited in irritation for the farce to end. There would be hard training during the coming ten days. These sops would soon forget the silly pledging and parading. Garth left the training of his makeshift army to the appointed captains, Rune, Hunnick, Bior, and Jumil. Thirty sergeants were identified from the existing garrison to aid them in their task. This left the Lord with a little time on his hands, and he was able to see Gareth almost every day. The boy seemed subdued and a little distant, but made good progress nonetheless. By the end of the first ten day, all five crystals responded instantly to his command. He was begging for something more advanced. Garth was amused with his eagerness, explaining that he would not be a good tutor in many areas of the art. Veer is gifted in different ways, and I suspect your strength is akin to his. You have a natural tendency to discover secrets, to see events hidden in the mist of time, past or future. I am uncomfortable with such things. They take much of my energy and leave me indisposed. The Keeper of the Towers will have to instruct you there. The boy seemed even more impatient. But what are the things you practice? What are the thinking, the thoughts? The old man smiled. You have read the book about Fenwith. He looked the boy squarely in the eyes, making sure Gareth could see his mouth. Then keeping his lips pressed together, he reached out with his thought. You must be closely related to speak in someone else's mind. The boy's eyes widened. Even if he had not seen that Karth's lips had not moved, he would have known that the old man had not spoken out loud. The curious stirring of meaning in his mind was far more immediate, far more intense than the stringing together of sounds to fathom their import. The rustling of thought inside him carried something of the thinker too, and could not be mistaken for another person. For a few moments he wanted nothing but to treasure the touch of those thoughts. He would think of nothing else, but soon the questions crowded in. How do you do it? Does it mean that we are closely related? How? You are not Viron, are you? But your eyes... Karth laughed loudly. I guess we must be related. But how? He shrugged. Who knows? He smiled did not falter. Would you not rather know the trick? Of course. There was more laughter now. There is none. You simply did not know that it could be done till you felt it yourself. Just direct your thought at me like you would your words. If you think of me and formulate a sequence, I will know it. The boy leaped from his chair in excitement. He turned away from Karth and closed his eyes. The next moment, the eager question, tainted with elements of the youthful spirit that sent it, reached the old man's mind. Do you know what I'm thinking? Something of his laughter slipped into his reply. No, only what you show me. There was a quick change. Gareth's signature, an imprint of who he was, spilled into the next thought. I'm glad we are related. It was impossible to pick out individual characteristics, yet each added to the whole, the quintessential aroma, a nebulous impression of the boy in front of him. Elements of his longing, sorrow, and regret, a trembling uncertainty, the warmth of his spirit, his partisan loyalty and fierce love, and a wild and desperate searching congealed into a simple, soft touch that could not be mistaken for any other. Karth broke the silence, 
causing Aerith to turn and face him again. Me too. I am also glad of it. A smile of wonderment split the boy's features. Can I do that with others? I would not advise doing it with those who know nothing of it. It can be a bit uh, startling when one does not expect it. And most people do not appreciate it if their thoughts are interrupted for little reason. It is a useful skill in the right circumstances. If you are searching for someone, for example... You mean I could be somewhere else in the castle and I would still hear you? That is entirely possible. How far can it reach? Garth considered this for a moment. It depends on the closeness of the relation and the strength of mind of the caller. But you must have a very strong call. Garth smiled. I'm glad you think so. The boy suddenly grew pensive. Shortly, an incredulous smile appeared. That's how he did it. He faced Garth off accusingly. Vera's spoken like this in my thoughts. And of course we are related. Vera has more talents than just the transmission of thoughts. For him, the very air seems to part and open up avenues to others. When last we spoke, it was like that. Almost more real than being face to face. His voice trailed off. Gareth understood. You have not spoken for a long time. No. A cloud had descended between them. He does not speak to you because of the summoning. Yes. He has not forgiven you. Would you have? Perhaps he has. It is possible. But he cannot forget it. He cannot trust me anymore. He cannot be certain of my regret or my desire to atone. I can tell him. Karth laughed loudly, and not entirely without mirth. I would appreciate it if you could. Gareth looked at him, a little stung by the reaction. Why are you laughing? Oh, child. Some things cannot be repaired once they are broken. And perhaps it is better so. The old man broke off abruptly. Somewhere in the veil the gate had opened. His words came quickly, his voice already distant. You have to go now. The hooded figure squealed in mortal terror. If Karth had been less annoyed, he would have found it humorous. The intruder's three fellows beat a hasty retreat, leaving him writhing in the roadway. It was tempting to destroy him outright, but the message would be infinitely clearer if he simply broke the feeble mind of Malik's battle priest and sent him back to Nun Merrick as a driveling fool. He held the hapless creature for a moment, then overwhelmed his weak purpose with an effortless thrust to feel it snap like the crushing of an asp's head. There was someone at his elbow. It was the boy again, open-mouthed. Panicky anger gripped him. What are you doing? Have I not told you to go? Have you lost your senses? The large eyes found his, fearful and uncertain. When you came here last time, when you came here... He waited impatiently. The fury he felt barely under the surface now. The boy looked away. They hurt you last time. I wanted to, wanted to help. The old man relented a little. He straightened up and folded his arms. They cannot hurt me here, but they can hurt you. Never enter this place again, not even in your dreams. You do not know better than I do, boy, and you understand very little about the veil. He held the child by the shoulder and forced him back to the room. Gareth was trembling. A look of contrite bewilderment etched on his face. I'm sorry. Don't say anything. Garth was struggling to control his temper. Do you realize how close you were to death? If they had noticed you, he gripped Gareth's shoulders and shook him a little. Swear to me that you will never go there again. The boy lowered his head and murmured. I swear. On your mother's ashes. On my mother's ashes. Garth pulled back and sighed heavily. <sighs> I'm not upset with you. I just don't want to see you hurt. They stood unmoving for a few moments. When there were no more words forthcoming, Gareth glanced at the man through his eyelashes. The worst of the storm seemed to be over. He probed for a reaction. May I ask you something? Karth's frown deepened, but he nodded. Who were they? How did they get in? What did you do to them? The old man turned away so that Gareth could not see his smile. He stepped over to the fireplace and sat down in one of the chairs. That's three somethings. The boy bounded over to him and flung himself down on the hearthrug. He had gained a little confidence again. I really am sorry. I won't follow you there again. Garth glanced at him, shocked. Are you trying to soften me up? Yes. No. 
The boy rested his chin in his cupped hands. I really have to know. Garth threw up his hands in mock despair. All traces of his temper had disappeared. Yes, I can see that you are quite desperate. What made you think I would not tell you? He raised his eyebrows. There are five gates to the portal veil, and another back door I have constructed while here in Fur. The gates are located in Bellruth, Aaron Rock, the Towers, Ariwis, and Lakeside. That's where the roads and the veil lead to. You understand, of course, that it is not a real place with trees and sand and grass as it appears to be. We made it that way simply for the people who would pass through it, not to lose their nerve or their reason. The gates in Belruth, the towers, and Arrowis are still open. The one in Erin is closely guarded and has been rendered inaccessible. The gate in Lakeside is not in my possession any longer. Malik has done something dark to it. I know not what, but there is a trap, no doubt. The intruders came in through that gate, perchance to slip through one of the others. I do not believe they were on their way here. I have hidden the gate to Heron Inrath among the trees. They do not realize how easily I can detect their foul presence in that place. It is almost a part of me, of my consciousness. I shaped it, and I keep it. My resolve is irresistible there. I cannot be touched by their feeble thoughts. To break their minds is like snapping a twig. Gareth considered what he had heard for a while without posing new questions. It had to be taxing for Garth to watch the veil all the time against interlopers. What happened when he was asleep? Can you not forever close the gates and lock them outside? I have thought of it many times. We may have need of them still in the days to come. Malik cannot force his way through while I am alive. He cannot use it for his swarm or his forces to slip behind the defenses of his enemies. I know he greatly desires to have it. The afternoon was wearing on. Garth rose from his chair. That is enough for today. I may have time for you tomorrow evening after supper. Go see what Anik is up to. The boy rose and flashed him a quick smile. Then you can show me how to keep those villains out of the veil. Garth watched him as he disappeared through the doorway. He was a strange one, this child of the union of the lines of Belruth and Gilreth. He smiled to himself. If Veer had fallen in battle, would he not have returned as such a one as this? opinion of the trainees dropped even lower during the first ten day of instruction. He was about ready to give up the effort altogether when Hanik hit upon the idea of a challenge among the instructors. He had made better headway than the others and boasted of his skill till everyone was thoroughly tired of his smiling face. Whenever Rune and Bior, often joined by Jumil, hunched low over their midday meal, frowning and complaining, the back-slapping, cheerful captain would interrupt their brooding discontent to brag about somewhere other feet observed among his recruits. Rune could see he was trying to draw them into an argument, but was despondent enough not to care. Once Hanik had subtly insulted their capabilities as trainers, the three were ready to accept any challenge to prove him wrong and silence his irritating claims. That afternoon, there was a new urgency to be seen among the sergeants, with four irate captains breathing down their necks. Gareth sat watching the spectacle of Hanik chasing his 420 men up and down the training yard till well after sunset. The sergeants singled out the laggards for encouragement or abuse as they saw fit, their voices already breaking with the strain of overuse. The boy looked on impassively, remembering the first days of his training in Belruth. He felt a little sad for being left out of it when there were others of his age struggling to keep up with the men. He had been included in Aaron, 
even though he was so much younger than the other members of Evrain's boat. But here, Karth would not employ him to help with the defense of Heron Inrath. It was uncertain what he was supposed to do. He lived for the moments when Karth could instruct him in the art, but there were large gaps between those times, and he had little with which to fill them. At last, the command came for the stumbling figures to halt. There was a collective moan of relief. Some dropped to hands and knees, their chests heaving and mouths agape. The sergeants walked about with scornful eye, commenting here and there on what they deemed a good or terrible performance. A loud command and a tramp of marching feet turned most of the heads towards the main gateway. Through it strode Captain Rune, closely followed by his men, neatly divided into seven blocks of sixty, and marching in step as if they had done it all their lives. He brought them to a tidy stop in front of Hunnick. Gareth was close enough to hear his scornful comment. What happened here? Your fellows seem a little worn out there, Hunnick. He swept his arm to indicate the yard, littered with gasping figures. Trying a little too hard, are we? A touch of pride surged through the boy. Hunnick rolled his eyes at Rune. Just move along, he said in mock exasperation. A sudden reckless thought struck the boy. Rune was closely related to him. Karth's warning forgotten, he reached for the mind of the smiling man in front of Hunnick. Rune felt the odd sensation, a pressure from somewhere, strangely familiar. Athera. He grasped his temple with a hand, resisting the intrusion. How could it be that she was still alive? Or had she found a way to reach him from beyond the boundaries of the dead? Is something the matter? Hunnick was looking at him strangely. Rune brushed the hand over his face and prepared to reply casually when he saw the hopeful face of the boy seated at the top of the stone steps behind Hunnick. Who is that boy? Hunnick turned to look. Oh, that's Gareth. Another Viron come to join us. Though he seemed more eager than any other to date. We didn't have to fish him out of the sea. He swam all the way here from Aaron by himself. Rune looked at him incredulously. What? Swam? From Aaron? Hunnick smiled and winked at him. You'll have to ask Karth about that one. Bjor had the training yard the next day. There was a dramatic difference between his approach and that of Hunnick. Of course, he instructed the men in archery, and was thus less inclined to spoil their already poor aim with too much running and jumping before they touched their bows. A line of straw figures had been placed along one wall of the yard, and the men formed single lines about twenty yards away. Those in front carried a bow and two arrows. Throughout the morning, Bior spoke to them in his deep voice, demonstrating now and then with his bow. Gareth loved watching him, for he made a show of hitting the mark from all angles, near and far, sometimes without seeming to aim properly. He was reminded of the day on Dura Beach, and the frown on the man's face as his arrow had failed to find its mark. Gareth had been a little wary of the tall Viron since then. Towards the afternoon, Bior allowed the recruits to practice with their bows, while his sergeants kept a watchful eye on them. He retired to the steps, and seeing the boys seated there, came to sit down next to him. Apart from nodding at Gareth as he approached, there was no attempt at conversation, and they sat in silence, not uncomfortably, with Dior observing the discouraging efforts of his trainees. He placed the bow between them. As soon as he did, Gareth became intensely aware of it. He felt the presence of the bow even stronger than that of its master. It was a thing of beauty, masterfully crafted, a symbol inlaid with mother of pearl, reminded him of the naming sigil he had worn on the clasp of his girdle. Glancing quickly at its owner, he picked up the weapon to examine it closely. Gareth ran his hand over the smooth wood of the bow. Admiringly, he felt the tension in the string. Bior glanced down at him. His voice was casual. You seen an air bow before? Oh yes, in Belruth during training. Training? For what? I am in the Guard, or at least I was. In the Guard? The Royal Guard? A small fry like you? 
Gareth sighed in exasperation. Why does everyone think I'm small? Uh, it is quite apparent if one but looks at you, Dior suggested. I'm not small, I am... I'm early, that's all. Dior did not reply, but it was clear from the odd frown on his brow that he regarded this statement as nonsensical. Gareth continued hastily. I was small as a baby, because I was born too early, they say. I was small as a guardsman, because they presented me too early. In the mountains, Kenneth told me I'd arrived too soon, expecting me to be a grown man, and now Karth said, Lord Karth. Bior's severe tone stopped him short. Sorry, Lord Garth said. Bior interrupted again, his thoughts having taken another direction. Kenneth of the Towers. Yes. You met Kenneth of the Towers. Something in the man's voice made Gareth look up sharply. Yes. You know who he is? Oddly, for such a big and fearless man, Bior was whispering. Gareth looked at him warily, as if taking his measure. He answered in the same whisper. The, the seer. Dior sat frozen in place, returning the boy's stare. Ere long he turned his eyes back to the men below. The silence lengthened. Then, abruptly, he rose to his feet, picked up the bow, and motioned to Gareth to follow. Well, let's see if you'll be any good with a bow. Perhaps you have the strength after all, though you seem a little small for it. Gareth was about to sigh once again when he caught the man's quick smile. He returned it, shaking his head, and leaped to his feet. Bior led him across the yard to where the men were enthusiastically missing the targets. You are wearing bracers? Gareth held up his leather-covered wrists. Put this on your right hand. Bior handed him a glove from a pile stacked behind the line of would-be archers. Now, show me if you can draw back this bow. Gareth was handed the beautiful instrument. He had longed for the day when he could try a strong Viron bow again. After all the strenuous work during his seasons in Arran, he was convinced that the bowstring would not resist him as resolutely as before. Without hesitation, he gripped the string and pulled on it till his right thumb brushed against his ear. Bior looked at him incredulously. You can draw it back all the way to your ear. Gareth tried not to let the strain creep into his voice. My arm is not as long as yours. True enough, but still... The man nodded approvingly and then asked, Can you hold it a little? Gareth nodded, though he did not feel that he could. The oar's voice boomed across the yard. Look here, you lot! The stripling boy, he placed a hand on Gareth's head, can draw the bow all the way. What's wrong with you? He turned back to the boy and said, You can let it go now. You're a little red in the face. Don't give us away. As if to confirm the oar's claim, the boy flushed scarlet, but he was encouraged by his small triumph. When the man handed him two arrows, he was emboldened enough to ask, May I practice here every day? Bior was secretly pleased. He had been a little envious of Hanik, who had so much to do with the strange boy who had crawled out of the sea. I don't see why not. Gareth felt he was progressing as he should be once more. Even if Garth talked more than taught when he summoned the boy to his quarters, and the art sometimes seemed as elusive to Gareth as ever, the personal training he received from such a renowned bowman as Bior more than made up for it. Each day his aim grew steadier, and he thrived under the praise and encouragement of this man he had regarded as aloof or even hostile. The watches he spent in the training yard were happy ones. Having sensed the resistance in the other, and realized his mistake in making the attempt to contact him, he stayed out of Rune's way. As far as the latter was concerned, he went about his work as if nothing had occurred. Whenever the boy was in the vicinity, he ignored him completely, not knowing what to make of his disturbing perceptions to date. That the child was closely connected to Karth, was also a point of suspicion. As for the possibility of going on future missions for the old man, he would handle that when it crossed his path again. The training was also showing more results than he had expected, now that his heart was in it, and he enjoyed the pleasant rivalry among the captains, especially Jumiel, who had not forgotten the lesson Rune had taught him in the courtyard. Karth was absent from the island for two ten days during Rhymesong. 
Gareth borrowed books from his library to occupy himself during the evenings, all the while bursting with curiosity concerning the old man's long trip. Had he gone to the towers to breach the gap with Veer? But there was a gate to the towers he would not have taken so long. Perhaps he was in the southern forest to see if the beast that Prince Rune had chanced upon really existed. All in all, it was a frustrating time, with only the little bit he knew of the art to practice over and over again. When the master finally returned, there was a palpable change all over the island. His inspection of the soldiers was brisk and sharp, his manner businesslike if not urgent. Everyone sensed it and adjusted their attitude accordingly. It was clear that the time for training and waiting would soon be over. To his immense surprise, Gareth was summoned that evening. It was later than usual, and certainly the master had to be tired from his long trip. Apprehensively, he entered the familiar room. Karth beckoned him over to the fire, where he was bidden to seat himself on the rug as before. Astonishingly, the old man came to sit next to him, facing the blaze. Gareth, a little bewildered, looked at him askance. What was happening? Garth spoke as he always had, in low, serious tones. You received much from your mother, child. Much more than she realized. Gilgreth is the oldest line of the Veron. Older even than the King's line in Belruth, Gareth found his voice. The King's line? Thieves and murderers. All of them? I do not know about the King's brother, Galad. He died young. Yet I have heard the whispers that he was killed by Rune outside my mother's door at night in a fit of jealous rage. Had he also joined the fight over her? Are they all beasts? Do not believe all the whispers you hear. Karth selected a chip from the woodpile and placed it on the hearthstones a yard from the fire grate. I am going to show you something useful. The trick of the battle priests. I know you have the talent for it. Without further delay, the old man coaxed a tongue of fire through the grate and lit up the wooden chip on the stones like a candle. The boy stared at him in amazement. What talent is that? Karth snuffed out the flame before he replied. You sense things when you touch an object, or sometimes even when a thought is suggested to you. It opens up a world where unseen things become plain to your perception. Even threats and intentions, good or bad, reveal themselves like flowers displaying their colors to the morning sun. Gareth shifted uncomfortably. Something had changed in the room like that first night he had walked up the steps outside Karth's door. The prickling started on his temples, and a slow chill worked its way up his spine. He shuddered. The voice droned on. Up till now, these things have come over you at random almost, whether you needed them or not. But it can and must be controlled. You are young for this, but not too young to make a start. You can compose a blade. That is very nearly the same thing. The spark to all this is inside you, your faith, your certainty, your will. Will is anchored in purpose. You can will something merely because you will it, but this will can be broken easily. It is only when purpose is strong that the will is also strong. Justice, restitution, vengeance, hate, these purer and lesser forms of lawful purpose are powerful indeed. Even spite and envy can inflame the will to particular solidity. But the strongest by far are the expressions of love, from base jealousy to the sacrifice of self for the good of others. Love drives and confines, inspires and arouses, till the lodestone of will is fired with a purpose and resolve that reaches even beyond mortality and time. The old man's voice trailed off. Gareth, trying to digest all that had been said, stared into the fire. It was easy to hate. But love could not be fabricated. It seemed a far more fragile thing to him. Next to him, Karth had gathered his stray thoughts. It has been so long since I have felt such power. I have been undone with quests for vengeance. Too many betrayals of trust have marred my purpose. But here, on this island, I have found the silence I have craved. Here I have endeavored to rid myself of spite and the burning need for revenge. Don't let your disappointment mar your purpose. If the poison once sets in, the art itself becomes a twisted thing and responds in ways you do not intend. Here, he motioned to the still smoldering chip. 
Bring the fire to it. It was a simple thing. He could touch the dancing amber heat with his thought, feel its volatile intensity, bend its course. But it was the blackened wood that provided purpose. There was the point on which to focus, a destination for the liquid force of the flame. It reached out to find the chip. He almost laughed out loud. Why can't any man do this? They do not believe it, for they were not born with the attribute, the talent, if you will, to see beyond their narrow reasoning. The man with a special skill for climbing mountains may enter terrain others regard as impossible. To him, the tall peaks are platforms. To them, they are obstacles. You may be able to climb to the very top of the tree, thanks to your fearlessness, your light weight, your curiosity, your daring, while others can only marvel from the ground. In you there is an aptitude for the art that very rarely is displayed to such a degree, even among the children of Veer. I could make a powerful man out of you. Awakening is not enough. There is much refinement needed. <sighs> he sighed. But the end of my world has come upon me at last, and I will not bend another of Veer's children to my will. He turned his face away, and stared oddly at the boy out of the corners of his eyes. Power must be given, for a specific task, or it has the ability to corrupt. Never desire it for its own sake. He pointed at the burning chip, shut it off. Gareth hesitated. But there is still fuel. There is always more fuel. End the purpose of the flame. It was no simple task for the struggling boy. The flame resisted. It was following the natural course, and he wanted to twist it. Karf let him struggle for a few moments, and then doused the flame himself. The boy looked at him questioningly. You felt it, didn't you? There is your first tiny step towards control, overcoming that resistance you encountered. If you become a master, you will break the minds of the villains in the Vale. Your purpose will be stronger than theirs, your resolve hard as chrysolite. He smiled again, but his eyes remained distant and cold. There is an easier way to douse the flame than to struggle against it with some imagined purpose. He rose from his position on the rug and moved to the chair. Now, we'll take it a step further. Take the chip and place it in the sconce by the door. Then, light it up again. Gareth looked from the fire to the sconce and back. The fire is too far away. Exactly. You will have to use a different fire. This will be quite a trick. Stand up. The boy obeyed. Close your eyes and listen closely. Garth's voice dropped a little more than a whisper. Again there was a stirring in the room, a pressure scarcely perceptible. There is fire in the air itself. Do you think it comes from the wood? Flames driven by a strong wind are unstoppable, leaping from one tree to another consuming the same wood much faster than here in the hearth. The air feeds it, like the bellows in the furnace of the blacksmith. There is an eager waiting of power in the air, in some places stronger than others. You have to sense it, here in this room. Gareth felt the sweat start on his body. He was suddenly stiflingly hot, but he dared not move or make a sound. The whispered words seemed to reach inside him, expanding till it filled his thoughts. Sense the stirring. Speak the arcane word for light, not the warmth of Imran's orb alone, but the spark of creation, the first lighting of the void, the flaming of purpose. Draw the potentials into a knot of expectation, right where you have your fuel, then touch it with a spark. Coax the potentials from the air. You need to bring it to the fuel. Other whispers mingled with Garth's words. More voices spoke out of the dark. There was fear and warning, moans of regret. Those of great power may set the air itself on fire. He clenched his teeth to ward them away. There was more than fire in the air. There was pain and anger and the lingering threat of the assassin still strong. He flinched from it, trembling. Karth mistook his hesitation for uncertainty. Take your time. First find that pressure, subtle but strong. The spark comes from you once you have the flow directed. Gareth opened his eyes to find the charred wood at his feet. Slowly, he paced across the room to place it in the empty wall sconce. He stepped back, regarding it closely. The firelight etched his outline on the wall. A taller shadow swallowed his. He was not ready. He knew it. Turning around to face Karth, he admitted defeat. I am not strong enough for this. 
Garth did not reply at first, but merely stared at him. At length he spoke. Perhaps. You are young still. In time. I would have thought your experience would have aided you. The apparent disappointment stung Gareth. What experience? All I've ever done is run, and hide, and beg, and be afraid. I could not face anyone. Not Malvor, or Talon, or Lucane, or Fingor. Not the wolves that tore Ryan, or the stinking men in the past. And I lied, and lied, to save myself, even when I came here. I am such a coward. I'm afraid because I have no strength. But you have power, and you are confident. A change had come over the old man. His face settled into a mask of bitterness. Don't crave power, boy, if you are unable to answer for the use of it. I only want to defend the people I care about. I cannot see them hurt. If I were strong as you are... Do you want to see my power, Gareth? The old man seemed suddenly immensely tired. For a moment he was beyond caring, prepared to reveal all, end the charade of appearance and play-acting, to unmask himself in all his terrible, unbearable might. Gareth cringed away from him. This man was still Kale, only wearing a different cloak. Was this a touch of the same madness that had brought about the summoning? Garth struggled against the hopeless frustration. The boy seemed to have grasped some of the implications of this mood, or he had more sense than cycles. His eyes were wide and flaring, his voice only a whisper. No. Power is nothing. No, it is less than nothing. It is evil enslaving and corrupting. It will twist anyone who cannot resist its false promises, its invitation to greatness. Through it you aim to win the respect of all, and if you do not take care, it sets you up as the proud master who no longer has an ear for the opinions of others, but sits in judgment over all his fellows. And you judge them, not because you are right, but because you are strong. The art is so much more than mere power. That was my failing. I would use it to serve me, instead of being used by it to serve others. Gareth did not reply. What was he to say? Garth was wrong. He could not be a weakling, to be preyed upon by every evil thing that crawled the surface of Myrel. He needed strength, at any cost, to preserve, to heal, to restore. He thought of Riot, the trees still looming in his nightmares, and suddenly there were tears, and the welling of purpose. The image of the death tree retreated. The fear and horror of that faraway hill gave way to an assurance that the sacrifice of his brother had not been in vain. And there it came, the dividing of potential in this enclosed space, the awareness of power in the air. He was strong. He would be strong, even if it was only for the memory of his lost friend. He lowered his head. The old man relented and turned away. Moments later, he swung round to stare at the half-smile of the child and the bright flame flowering from the charred wood in the sconce. The frustration drained from him. I am a poor instructor, but you learn nonetheless. Come here. Garth stood up and walked over to the window. He opened the shutters and the cold night air rushed in. The boy joined him reluctantly. He was exhausted and depressed. The art tonight was no longer a beautiful thing. The wind had died down. Above them, the black void stared down with a thousand bright eyes. The smell of the dark ocean streamed over them. Outside, the darkness stretched for untold miles in all directions, over things seen and unseen, perceived and mysterious. Gareth wanted to put his hands over his ears. It was too big. He was drowning in it. He closed his eyes and fought away the rising giddiness. My head hurts. There was a hand on his shoulder. Just stay for a while. A desperate sadness settled over him. Trembling, he struggled for control over his runaway emotions. This was not what he had so fervently longed for. Now that answers were coming to him, he did not want them any more. He remembered a moment in Belruth, and a frightening suspicion brought to life by the pressing darkness. When at last he could trust himself to speak, Gareth made another attempt. In my role, there is more darkness than light. Is that not so? Imran hides his light for eleven days at the end of each cycle. I thought that if light were stronger, it would prevail most of the time. Karth looked at him strangely. He did not reply immediately. Turning his back on the night, he stood staring at the fire. His voice was low and gentle. Yet, 
There is light even when Imran's orb has traveled beyond our horizon. The children of Myrol burn their candles and watchfires through the dark times. Gareth closed his eyes. It seemed to him that the sadness had penetrated every part of his body. The flames are small and weak. The darkness heavy. The smallest candle lights the place where you are, and darkness is dispelled by it. And if I have no candle? You are the candle. And if you sit in the dark, it is because you have made the choice. Like the candle of tallow, it costs something to radiate light. You sacrifice your own substance, and like it also, the light is mostly for the use of others. Find someone to burn for, and it will never be dark where you are. Look at the stars. They are all candles burning in the dark void. What darkness can quench them? Perhaps, as time passes, some may fade and die, yet there will be others to take their place, blazing forth in a new pattern of meaning. Their beauty is only seen when the orb of Imran has departed. He placed a hand under the boy's chin and turned his face towards him till the warm glow of the fire illuminated half of it. You see, Gareth, darkness has no substance of itself. It is only when light is absent that we are ever affected by it. Do not let the big, dark world you live in scare you into silence. Burn as bright as you can, even now, when the next star floats so far away, and you know not when the sun will rise again. I look at you, and think that this is what all the children of Imran should have been like. Bright and cheerful, even in the face of strong adversity. More interested in healing than causing hurt. At last, the flicker of a smile touched the boy's face. But... I am a child of Veer, not of Imran. Karth smiled sadly. Poor boy. Do you not know that the mighty Veer is the firstborn of Imran? You mean, he is more than myth? Karth slowly shook his head. All myths are anchored in distant truth. It is our gift to discover that truth that gives meaning to the myth. You mean, the dreams? Dreams, portents, visions. Karth took a step backwards. Do you know how difficult it was for me? To watch your progress into Aaron, to have my agents aid you, to know your value, and not being able to influence your decisions. I could not send for you, or have you brought to me. I had to wait and watch for fate to intervene and bring you here. Why? Because I walk a delicate path between prophecies and dreams, a fate I cannot see in its entirety, where I interfere to bring something about that I believe should be so. I may, in fact, destroy the possibility. I may then have to wait longer still, or be forced into a more dangerous, more difficult path. There is a providence at work, I have no doubt. It is best not to get in the way. A providence? Something that directs our course. Or someone. The gods? Karth was staring at the fire again. He seemed not to have heard. His thoughts had already taken another avenue. I am glad that our paths crossed in this way that I could have you here for this length of time. You will discover many more things about the Ark without my aid. You have gifts with which I am not too familiar. Confusion whirled through Gareth's tired mind. What was happening? Are you saying farewell to me? Not as yet, but the time has come for you to burn even brighter. If I can persuade Prince Rune to go to Aaron, you will go with him. Oh! There was suddenly too much to digest. Too many contradictory emotions. Now, off to bed with you. There is little enough time left to get some rest. Gareth turned towards the door. Certainly, the night was far spent. And what a night it had been. It would take forever to make sense of all the things he had seen and heard. In the doorway, he turned. The uneasiness of earlier pushed on him again, this time intensified. There was a hint of insincerity in something the man had told him. A thought suggested itself. What you said about the light and the darkness, you don't believe it is so, do you? Karth made no reply.
contingents made surprisingly good progress. Perhaps it was because he had the greater part of the islanders and Aaronites with him, or because he had taken the challenge from Hanik more seriously than the others. But by the end of three ten days, his recruits were stronger, better disciplined, and more skillful with a sword than Jumil's or Hanik's. They would move on now, for training with the bow under Bior, and oddly, it was almost sad to see them go. Despite himself, he had inched closer to the defenders of Heron Inrath, with their strengths and weaknesses, their zeal and courage. In a way, he hoped that the ordeal Karth had pictured for them would not materialize in such a severe manner. The stay in Fur had done much to restore his relationship with Karth. There had been no angry words between them since the first meeting. Both men felt it better to pretend that the unpleasantness had not occurred at all. When the old man visited the training yard, he was always careful not to express any criticism. Rune noticed it, but did not appreciate this gesture. It was a testimony to their still strained relations. Other insignificant things made him uneasy. Whenever the white-haired boy he had first seen in the courtyard was in the vicinity, it made him singularly uncomfortable. Why would he even notice one particular child among a hundred others? It was the eyes, he told himself, that first strange look, mistaken for the haunting of Athera, now refined into... What? Expectation? Accusation? Did the boy make him feel guilty? Of what? Of an evening, he indulged in the local wine as if this old tactic would decide the battle in his favor one more time. But even as the struggle eased off, other issues filled the gap in his tired thinking. Was it possible to meet another person in this world without being measured and judged? Even Karth looked at him that way, forever gauging whether he would live up to expectations. What did they want? Haldred had him weighed, even if she changed her mind later on. She changed her mind. Perhaps, if they liked what they saw, they would leave him be. But he would not wear a mask for anyone. They would have to be content with the way he was. It would be stretching the truth to say that she had been content. Though she had annulled her judgment of him, and she had seen past the prejudice and the slander, he had not met another like her. It was a balm to his greatest confidence. What if she was Ligerian? He was through with Nurians. He ought to go back to Breck and break the neck of that ruffian she had married. Then he would take her into the east, far away, far away from that child's blue eyes, always fixed on him, waking or asleep, as if he had been the one at fault. He expected the summons from Garth, but was still apprehensive to meet with him. Now would be the moment of truth. The new danger he was to be tossed into would be announced. Did it matter where he had to go? If he could not trust this man, one place was as dangerous as the next. Karth chose a different line of attack, his favorite. This time, he concentrated on recent events in Trax Isles. It took some skillful maneuvering on Rune's part, but he refused to have his motives weighed and analyzed. The old man was persistent. You did not kill Gran to deliver and avenge the people of Kerton? Rune contemplated this for a moment. I had a personal score to settle. True. Karth's smile gave the lie to his response. Inexplicably, Rune felt he had to defend himself. What are you looking for? Some sign? Some quality worth redemption? You will not find that in me. I am not that weak. Not any more. I know where loyalty and affection lead. I have told you before. I will not embrace any cause but my own. I am not looking for a hero's grave somewhere on a foreign battlefield. Let them sing about some other fool when the dust has settled. This man will be far away. Smiling again at the mischief he has caused those who swore to destroy him. But you do not play fair. You sent me to Nuria, to Gilrath, so that your allies there could break my resolve and convince me that I am in the wrong, that I do not understand the past. I understand it. I was there when it unfolded. I still bear the consequences of that unfolding. He paused to glare at Karth. When I returned unshaken, you threw me into the dragon's mouth, so to speak. Did you hope I would not return from Lakeside? Did you hope that monster in the south would rid you of your bad bargain? Now it is you who do not play fair. At no point did I force you into any danger but what you agreed to. 
there was always an opportunity to pull out. And in the forest? Where was my opportunity to pull out? I swear to you that I did not know that such creatures existed there. Yet you suspected it. I did. And you thought it better not to warn me. It was a mistake, yes. But your discovery is of vital importance to our cause. Your cause be damned. I will not be a martyr for you. There was a strained silence as they glared at each other. Do you want out? Without my payment, I would think not. You may remain here in fur till the time comes. I assure you it won't be long now. I will summon you to witness or participate in Fingor's final moments. Perhaps then you may realize that you cannot stand neutral in this affair. Garth's voice rose, fierce, passionate. There is no hole deep enough for you to crawl into, and your petty spite will be swallowed up in the tempestuous rivalry of gods, who will spoil all of Myrol and martyr all her people to quench their thirst for vengeance. But close your eyes to it, stick those bloodied fingers of yours in your ears, and whistle for a fair wind. It may just be that you live your last few days in peace and contentment. Rune was speechless at this tirade. He looked away, opening and closing his mouth several times, before he could formulate a reply. I am a man of action. I do not sit on the sidelines to await events. If I am to remain here, I will play my part, but on my terms. What do you propose? I will know the reason for each mission before I agree to it, as well as the dangers involved. There will be no more surprises, no more garrulanes, no more dragons, no more crawling through the dark and lakeside, and no more playing with my mind. It was cold on the wooden walkway. Rhyme's song had completely encircled Heron Inrath in its frosty grip. The tall masts of Garth's small fleet swayed like needle trees blowing in a high wind. They rode their anchors just off the dockside of Angen, protected from the regular western gales by the tall hillside upon which Fir held vigil. Gareth's breath steamed in the low lamplight of the storm lantern. He pressed his back against the wooden wall of a large storehouse, sheltered against a freezing blow. The rushing of the restless sea was all around him, as if the planks beneath his feet were but the deck of a gigantic ship in the middle of the ocean. He thrust his hands deep into the folds of his surcoat and waited. In little more than a day, he would leave his refuge and return to Aaron. Perhaps he would see Evrain again, and Lur. A queer feeling started in the pit of his stomach. He missed them, and the watermen who had taken him in so readily. Oh, what a joy it would be to wake up one more time in Zane's empty room, and hear the washing of the sea outside his open window. And he would glide through the grey water of the bay as the morning sun gilded the horizon behind Lemoen. From the washroom, he could smell the freshly baked loaves and hear the laughter of Mirail and Lay as they readied the morning meal. Veer's voice no longer startled him. Look towards the east. A touch in the nape of his neck and the stars so close he could breathe in their fragrance. The pressure increased, but there was no pain. Light flowed about him till he was warm with it, safe and sheltered by it. There were trees now, thousands upon thousands of them, an unbroken green sea bordered in the distant east by mountains. He is not as wise as he believes himself to be. In the caverns under the dank wood, he has hid what he could not destroy, a horde of crafted chrysolite, the ransom of an entire nation, and at last I have found it. With so much of it beckoning, the mists of Terrellon had to part. A clearing opened in the endless trees, a burnt-out city. Great terror came with it, overwhelming evil and hatred, till he wanted to cry out with it and cover his eyes. Only he was too scared to do so, for he had to be alert and watching, 
listening for the sound of a horn and the heavy footfalls of the pursuer. Down the chimney of rock, into the bowels of Myrol they rushed, as if the cavernous depths could shield them from the clawing beasts so close by. He turned and was alone. The threats closed in about him. Steel collars and heavy chains held them back. The red eyes glared at him with immeasurable malice. Their anger was a searing fire, ready to consume all within reach. The reek of decay hung about them like a mist, permeating their sleek muscled frames, the powerful bend of their necks, the gaping walls, the lethal talons. It could not be. These were the fabrications of nightmare. Such monsters could not exist. A boy passed by him, down a long tunnel littered with fallen rock. His eyes reflected the light of the torch he carried, his feet hurrying as if he had the most urgent tidings to bring. A healing cut marked the left side of his face. Angry red streaks ranged over his ribs, and a dirty cloth half concealed the deep tooth marks on his arm. His body and the rags about his waist were unwashed, but there was purpose in his step and a brightness in his virile eyes. Behind him came a young man, scarred and dirty, his fair hair matted and unkempt. He moved like a cat, silent, lithe, and controlled. In the set of his mouth, the turn of his head, the reach of his hand, a latent power whispered of great deeds, of exploits and potentials no longer heard of in my role. His face was impassive, as if sadness could no longer touch him, and misery was an accepted part of life. Whatever force had attempted to destroy his spirit had nearly strengthened it instead. A tremendous pull, like the beckoning he had felt in the Temple of Belruth, turned his head down a dark passage and into a cavern, heaped in careless piles, stacked and shelved on rough stone, lay the treasures of thousands of cycles of Vadran craft. Euban's store was an empty market stall compared to it. Oh, the sight of such things stirred memories of the hidden ancient times, of books forbidden, and deep dreams of what had been before. Something dragged at him, dividing his perception. The boy, waiting outside, breathless, and others with him, like him, and more, many, many more, waiting in the dark, fearful, hopeful. There was too much to grasp, to contain inside the frame of his mind. The voice had more than words to bring its illumination. There was more than common understanding to receive it. See, in the dark, I will wait for him, a true son calling. And when there are such as he, why would you save the sick and corrupted? The question burned in him, for he had no answer. Would he let them go, Fengor, and the hateful Talon, Lucane the traitor, and Huben? and his mother, and, and Rue.